What's up, everybody? I'm the GojiView philosopher, and the rules for WKF-style point sparring have always kind of confused me. I'm adamant that the current WKF rule set doesn't make a lot of sense, not only because it's not really geared towards producing very effective fighters, but also because the most useful strategies and techniques in kumite are often completely different than what we practice in the rest of our karate. But those thoughts are a video for another time, so if you want to know my full reasoning why I think the WKF rule set isn't really that great for karate, then let me know that you're interested in the comments. The WKF rules are designed to, as much as possible, prevent competitors from getting injured, particularly the kinds of injuries that would lead to chronic traumatic encephalopathy or other similar long-term conditions, which is why they've largely eliminated all contact to the head, and even strikes to the body have to stop somewhere between 5 centimeters or just touching the skin. The protectors that are standardly worn in kumite are also designed to give competitors a little bit of extra leeway, so that an accidental touch to a place that's not supposed to get hit doesn't cause that sort of long-term injury. These are all noble goals, but they've had the accidental side effect of making it pretty hard to tell the difference between a worthless technique and a technique that was correctly controlled, especially for an observer who's trying to judge the match. Some sports, such as fencing, have gotten around this difficulty by implementing an electronic uniform as a type of scorekeeping device, so that even if a referee doesn't see a strike when it lands, the computer can still record it. There are a few systems like this that have been developed for karate and taekwondo, but this type of system can't tell the difference between a technique that happens to connect and a technique that's performed with the correct intention. And besides, your fist isn't actually a sword, and getting touched by a strike doesn't guarantee that that strike would have hurt you. So how do WKF judges make the determination if you scored or if your technique was worthless? Well, a quick look at the official rulebook put out by the WKF in 2020 gives us the following criteria. Good form, sporting attitude, vigorous application, awareness, in parentheses, zanshin, good timing, and correct distance. Most of these make a sort of practical sense. You've got to do your technique right, you've got to do it with power, and you've got to do it at the appropriate time to hit, getting in before it can be deflected. Sporting attitude and correct distance are also there to help maintain the ideal of not beating your opponent to a bloody pulp, since WKF Kumite generally has different goals than, say, Pride FC. But what is that fourth criterion, Zanshin, and why is it so important? Well, I got interested and started looking into the concept, and it turns out that it's a lot more complicated than the simple definition of awareness that the WKF gives. So, this is going to be that video. Zanshin. What is it? How do you know when you've got it? And most importantly of all, if you told a karateka in 1850s Okinawa that you were performing your techniques with Zanshin, would they or would they not look at you like a crazy person? Let's get into it. Alright, so let's start off with the question of what the definition of Zanshin really is. The term Zanshin is most commonly written with the characters for remaining and heart slash mind, but where exactly it is that your heart or mind is supposed to be remaining is where we start to get into the key concept. Rather than pondering over the mistakes of your past, or puzzling out the possibilities for your future, Zanshin can sometimes be called keeping your mind in the here and now, so that your mind remains present and alert. In the context of WKF Kumite, the official rulebook, which I downloaded from their website, gives me the following definition. Zanshin is described as a state of continued commitment in which the competitor maintains total concentration, observation, and awareness of the opponent's potentiality to counterattack. Some competitors, after delivering a technique, will turn their body partially away from the opponent, but are still watching and ready to continue the action. The judges must be able to distinguish between this continued state of readiness and one where the competitor has turned away, dropped their guard in concentration, and in effect has ceased fighting. From this definition, we can see that the concept of Zanshin is closely linked with the idea of readiness, the potential to act, even if you don't end up making a move. Rather than executing a technique as a last-ditch effort, or throwing a bunch of techniques out there to see if one will stick, the WKF wants any scoring technique to be performed with the mental willingness and physical discipline to keep fighting, even if any given punch or kick doesn't quite get through. However, I personally have a few questions about how the judges are supposed to determine the presence of Zanshin. If the criterion for Zanshin is that your eyes are pointed towards your opponent and your guard is still raised, which for WKF Kumite doesn't actually look that much different from a lowered guard, then isn't it possible that someone could appear to be completely focused without actually having their mental attention fixed on their opponent? If the judge is on the other side of the map, then how are they even able to tell where the competitor's eyes are facing? 
In the rulebook, the WKF mentions that Zanshin is the criterion that is most often missed when a score is assessed. A judge is capable of assessing the external appearance of a situation, but it's starting to seem like Zanshin is more of a je ne sais quoi, an undefined or at least poorly defined quality. We'll get back to this point a little bit later. I think that we can get a better idea of what Zanshin actually means by analyzing it in the context of other, more traditionally Japanese martial arts. Like so many terms and concepts that are now part and parcel with our global understanding of karate, the idea of Zanshin was adopted into Japanese karate when it was introduced to the mainland. The mainland Japanese martial arts that are most closely associated with Zanshin as part of their regular practice are Kendo and Kyudo, the modern versions of swordsmanship and archery. Kendo specifically has a long history of using Zanshin as its main criterion for determining Yuko Datotsu, the effective type of strike that's used to warrant an Ippon victory. Professor Alex Bennett, a kendoka who spent more than 20 years living in Japan, and who holds a 7th dan in kendo as well as dan ranks in both Iaido and Naginata, gave a very interesting TED talk on the notion of Zanshin, which is linked in my descriptions and that I'll also put up in a card right about now. Fair warning, he did give that talk in Japanese, and there aren't English subtitles, but if you've got a spare 20 minutes and a decent understanding of the language, I highly recommend watching it. The grammar and vocabulary aren't too complex, so even someone like me was able to understand it. In that talk, he discusses the idea that Zanshin is a natural outgrowth of the mindset of Shinken Shoubu, fights with real live blades, that Kendo is still trying to emulate to this day. In the event that a participant in a duel were to relax at the moment that they felt their sword cut their opponent, the doomed opponent could exploit this lapse in attention to cut them down as well, leading to an Aiuchi, or mutual killing. During the Warring States period and early Edo period, when the warrior's pilgrimage was still a common feature of samurai life, any swordsman, whether they were taking part in that pilgrimage, or whether they were challenged by someone who was on that pilgrimage, would have had to understand that potentiality and behave accordingly in their duels. This understanding was then maintained even through the civilizing period of Middle Edo, when live blades were mostly switched out either for wooden bokken or split bamboo shinai. After all, as Miyamoto Musashi's career proves, even a bokken can still be a very deadly weapon in the right hands. To Professor Bennett, the maintenance of zanshin is what separates budo from other sports, even as they undergo a process of becoming more sport-like. Not letting your guard down is important in a practical sense, but it was also connected to a type of moral sense that's very different than most modern sports outlooks. For those situations where the outcome of a duel could have resulted in the death or permanent disfigurement of one or both of the participants, striking the final blow might have been a relief, but was certainly not a cause for celebration. The type of celebration that you might see in, to use Bennett's example, a soccer match after a goal has been scored is considered to be completely inappropriate to the martial arts, and it also represents the type of lapse in attention that Zanshin seeks to avoid. After all, he mentions, the taking of a life is a serious event, and cheering out as you did so could be interpreted as disrespectful to the person that you just struck down. Despite the fact that the stakes of modern kendo are no longer lethal, this mental attitude is still reflected in their practice to this day. In Kyudo, the Japanese art of archery, the term zanshin has even more special meaning. Archery was one of the first, if not the first, martial art to be systematized into martial ryu, and as such, the ritualistic element of Japanese martial arts is at its most developed in Kyudo practice and other descendants of the 8th century Yumiya no Michi, the way of the bow and arrow. In that discipline, the concept of zanshin has come to stand for every aspect of the attention being paid while firing an arrow, but especially the follow-through, which is of utmost importance in archery. Anyone who's ever hit a baseball, kicked a soccer ball, or driven a golf ball will be familiar with the concept that the follow-through, which determines the direction of force and the rotation of the struck object, is incredibly important for accuracy. Or, to put it in the terms that a younger me would have preferred, in a slap shot, if you don't point your stick at the goal, the puck is going to go wild. In the case of Kudo, the risk of a momentary lapse of attention isn't that you'll be hit and struck down by your enemy, but rather that that relaxation will cause your arrow to deviate. In reality, the arrow hasn't truly been loosed at the instant that your fingers release it. Instead, the whole arrow has to clear the bow before your body can relax. That means that your attention has to remain solid until you're more than sure that the arrow has been loosed. Of course, the term zanshin usually has a little bit more of a spiritual connotation than just that. In fact, the reason that most Western practitioners even know of this concept is through the famous book Zen in the Art of Archery by Eugen Hergel and the lasting legacy of his teacher, Kenzo Awa. Kenzo specifically drew inspiration from Buddhist meditation and breathing techniques, and eventually founded a religious sect called the Dai Shadow Kyo, 
or the great teaching of the way of shooting, based on his spiritual understanding of archery. Aside from Kenzo, Kudo practitioners have a long and ongoing history of using deep ritual symbolism in their practice, with Q-dojos even being constructed according to Japanese directional taboos, facing their targets and their kamiza in auspicious directions. In fact, even in karate, quite a large influence in our way of thinking has been received from various religious practices. Although karate, like all martial arts traditions, isn't inherently tied to a specific religion, in his 1993 article The Ritual Dimension of Karate Do, John Donahue mentions that the modern karate dojo is often ruled by certain rituals, almost all of which are drawn from the imagined connections between Zen and the samurai. Despite the lack of any real historical connection between karate and either the samurai or the Zen religion, karate dojos often draw a lot of structural and functional inspiration from Zendo, the halls in which Zen meditation is practiced. Donahue asserts that the ritual nature of karate do is not mere window dressing, but an important component of what makes karate do so attractive to modern Americans. Historian T.J. Stiles, a fifth dan practitioner of Shotokan, described that he had an interest in not simply practicing a sport with a Buddhist name, and says that when he read that Funakoshi Gichin had chosen the character Ku for karate, at least partially because of its connection with the Buddhist concept of sunyata, that this helped to push him to go beyond simply technique and to pursue the self-perfection side of his karate. Most of the videos of Karateka explaining Zanshin that I watched as research for this video follow these sort of similar lines in their explanation of its importance. Zanshin is part of the ritual aspect of why they train, and either on its own or in the larger context of practices like bowing to the shomen or kamiza, or starting class in mokso, it represents an aspect of karate that seems to elevate it above merely sport. These rituals are, to put it in the terms of Professor Bennett, a part of the Ningen Keisei no Michi, the way of human development. This aspect takes karate outside of the domain of physical technique, elevating it instead to a psychological process that continues well beyond the performance of any one technique or one set of techniques. After all, a thousand punches don't make you a better person. They totally do. The practice of mokso specifically seems to be incredibly important to developing zanjin, although there are two different ways in which mokso practice is used for this purpose. Vince Morris, a Shotokan karateka whose book on Zanshin I picked up in a secondhand bookstore, which was the inspiration for me to write this video, describes these two forms of mokso practice as both being important in developing this aware state. The first of these is just sitting, known as zazen or seated meditation, where one sits and breathes slowly, allowing one's mind to flow while attempting to detach it from any individual thought. There are a number of ways that different schools use to foster this practice, such as mudras or hand positions, or the counting of one's breaths, and this is the form of mokso that you see most commonly in karate dojos. This type of practice is deeply rooted in Zen traditions, and in fact, it's almost exactly the same as what I experienced when I visited the Zen Temple of New York City a few years back. The other form of mokso practice draws on visualization, a feature that's common to many schools of Buddhism, but which is often particularly advanced in the Vajrayana or esoteric schools. However, whereas Buddhist practice might have you visualize a mandala, or Amida's Pure Land, Vince Morris's type of visualization only extends to visualizing your own body, and perhaps that of an imaginary opponent. This form of mokso is much less common, as it's primarily suited for individual practice as opposed to group practice. However, according to Morris, this form of practice can greatly improve one's ability to execute techniques. Visualizing yourself performing the technique and correcting individual errors aims to allow you to eliminate the process of thinking about the technique as you perform it, freeing up your attention to focus on processing the sights and sounds. Several news reports about studies that I've seen have promoted visualization practice as having certain benefits like this, but I personally haven't been able to access those studies, so I can't say for certain what their findings were. But I think that the fact that this type of practice is so common in so many different sports at least suggests that there might be some benefit to it. To wrap this section up, though, perhaps the best explanation of what Zanshin is, or rather what it isn't, comes from TJ Styles' recollection of a lesson in humility that he learned while sparring without gloves. He recalls facing someone who had beaten him in a previous competition, this time in a friendlier bout in the dojo. I felt him building up to erupt toward me. Relaxed and aware, I waited, and caught him right at the start of his attack with a jab to the chin. A glow of triumph swept over me, at which point he punched again, slicing open my upper lip. Pretty harsh way to learn the lesson that a fight isn't over just because you struck what feels like a conclusive technique. As you might have noticed by now, 
The concept of Zanshin seems to have heavy influence from the practice of Buddhism, particularly the Zen school. Certainly, the cultivation of Zanshin is very similar, albeit with radically different goals, to the modern practice of mindfulness, staying present in the moment and being aware of yourself and your surroundings without fixating on any one thing or letting your mind stagnate. Several of the sources in my description quote the famous Zen monk Takuan Soho, an itinerant monk who served as an advisor to the famous swordsman Ito Ittosai and Yagyu Munenori, as well as to the third Tokugawa shogun Iemitsu. One of his famous quotes is the following. If the mind congeals in one place and remains with one thing, it is like frozen water and is unable to be used freely, ice that can wash neither hands nor feet. When the mind is melted and is used like water, extending throughout the body, it can be sent wherever one wants to send it. While the historical equivalence between Rinzai Zen, which was Takuan's sect, or any other type of Zen practice, and the martial culture of Edo period Japan is by no means universal, which I have a video about, go watch that, Zen was an important player in Japanese society at the time, and many people, including martial artists, were deeply influenced by its practice. So in order to better understand Zanshin, it might be useful to take a look at some of the other mental states that are commonly associated with Zen Buddhist practice, or with other Buddhism. In general, there are five mental states that I've found that are commonly associated with Budo or with martial arts in general, although one of them is occasionally omitted from some of these lists. Besides Zanshin, these states are Shoshin, Mushin, Budoshin, and the one that's occasionally left out, Ishin. Let's go through these one by one. First off, Shoshin. This term is so common, not only in martial arts or in Zen practice, but in all of Japanese life, that it has a standard translation into English, beginner's mind. The most common interpretation of this concept can be summed up by the famous quote by Suzuki Shunryo, which goes, In the beginner's mind there are many possibilities, in the expert's mind there are few. This concept is often brought up in terms of avoiding the Dunning-Kruger effect, which, to simplify it to the point of losing its nuance, is the trend of people with a relatively low skill level feeling more confident in their knowledge than people who have genuinely built up a base of true skill. The belief in one's expertise creates a sort of mental block, preventing one from being willing to explore those areas in which they might actually be less knowledgeable. Socrates' proclamation that he is wise because he knows that he knows nothing, which, fun fact, he never actually said, expresses a very similar idea. Columbia University Dean James Valentini is so fond of the concept of beginner's mind that he includes it in the convocation speech that he gives every year to new undergraduate students. This sort of admonition is especially important for the type of person who makes it into an Ivy League school, or who earns a black belt, since they usually come from a pool of the smartest people in their high school community and are very sure of their own intelligence. But the big fish in a small pond might not be the big fish when they're moved to a larger pond full of fish who are respectively the biggest fish in their own small ponds. The state of Shoshin is intended to combat the preconception of one's own knowledgeability and open oneself to the potential that they might know less than what they thought they did or even that what they thought that they knew may have been an illusion all along. Next up, we have Mushin, a term that means no mind. This concept is so closely related to Zanshin that John Donahue even refers to it as essentially a heightened version of Zanshin. And in terms of abandoning all attachments to lingering thoughts, that sort of description might be correct. Jesse Enkamp, along with a few other people, refer to Mushin as being related to the state of flow or being in the zone, a sense gained during an activity that each of your actions and moves follows naturally from the previous one and proceeds naturally into the next one. This state also implies that the conscious mind doesn't intercede in the performance of an action. One way that I've heard it described is that as you walk upstairs, you don't have to think about each individual step as you do so. You simply instinctively know how to walk upstairs, and you can focus instead on the number of steps or on talking to someone as you walk upstairs. This is also the mental state that's most commonly associated with mokso almost always concurrent with the version of that practice where you let your mind focus on nothing at all. This form of meditation is similar to the Buddhist practice of reflecting on the fundamental emptiness of oneself, one's surroundings, and even of the Buddha himself. It also has some affinity with Taoist practice, since the mind is sometimes thought of as interfering with the natural way of following the Tao. But one thing to note is that, while many karateka and religious people have tried to reach this state, it's considered incredibly difficult to actually achieve. That means that for most people, it remains a goal that one must constantly strive towards, even though they may never actually arrive. Then there's Fudoshin, the immovable mind. This mental state is actually heavily connected to a specific Buddhist deity known as Fudo Myo, the immovable wisdom king. 
The Wisdom Kings are said to be the protectors and the manifestations of various Buddhas, with Fudo being the Wisdom King manifestation of the Dharma body of the historical Gautama Buddha, or sometimes of Manjusri, the Bodhisattva associated with insight. Fudo was considered to be an incredibly militant deity, with his wrathful form often being depicted carrying a sword and smiting non-believers. No wonder, then, that he became an incredibly important deity in many martial artists' practice. Funakoshi Gichin's book, Karate do Kyohan, features an image of a Kongo Rikishi deity on its cover, which is depicted as carrying the same Vajra sword as Fudo, but the greater influence that this deity has actually had on karate is in the naming of the Fudo Dachi, or immovable stance, not to mention this mental state, of course. The immovability represented by Fudoshin is one of absolute intent. It is the resolve that is shining on the path, even brighter than the rising sun. Therefore, Fudoshin is the absolute desire to achieve your goals no matter what. That could be a mind-over-matter dedication to complete your last set of lifts, even when your muscles are screaming out and begging you to stop. Or it could represent the unwillingness to let your opponent's ki scare you during kumite. Both determination and self-control are useful translations of this concept, although neither one of them gets it 100% right. In my personal opinion, though, Tom Petty said it best. I won't back down. And last up, we have Ishin, which means unified mind. Us Karateka probably recognize this phrase from the Ishin new style, founded by Shimabukuro Tatsuo, although Koryu Bujutsu fans may also recognize it from the Ishin new Kusarigama Jutsu, an old chain and scythe technique that has been subsumed into Shinto Musoryu. In common use, the term Ishin often means wholehearted or intently, which tells you most of what you need to know, at least as a basic example. Fudoshin means being unwavering when pursuing a goal, but Ishin means focusing your entire energy, both physical and mental, on the accomplishment of that task. This sort of attitude is incredibly useful in keeping your concentration from slipping onto something else or from getting lost into thought, which is why I think that among these four it's probably the closest concept that I've mentioned to Zanshin. These four additional states of mind give us a closer look into the cultural context that Zanshin comes from. In fact, compared to some of these states, Zanshin is rather simple to define. It is certainly much better suited to being used as a criterion for determining a successful technique than these other mental states. Shoshin is a constant way of approaching one's instruction in practice, Mushin is nearly impossible to achieve, and both Fudoshin and Ishin are incredibly difficult to determine from outward appearances. For Zanshin, at least, there are a few obvious signs of when it's not there. But it can be difficult enough for oneself to be fully aware of having achieved one of these states, even Zanshin. A study of Kendoka indicated that there are measurably longer periods of attention, as measured both by time before blinking and brain activity, in martial artists experienced with the practice of Zanshin, but that the reaction times of Kendoka were not significantly different than those of the control group. Those differences that were measurable were so small as to be almost impossible to determine with the naked eye. However, despite it being so difficult to judge whether a competitor exhibited it or not, Zanshin has taken the position as one of the most important factors in determining a technique's validity. There are many reasons why kendo isn't an Olympic sport, but one of the main reasons is that the International Kendo Federation doesn't have any real wish to revise the rules for what constitutes a yuko datotsu. These criteria, of which Zanshin is one of the most important, involve complicated concepts, many of which are difficult to grasp for foreign practitioners and younger Japanese generations. The criteria of yuko datotsu, as well as the ethical and etiquette-focused concepts of the more generalized budo mindset that kendo holds as its guiding principle, mean that the Japanese kendo community has a huge influence over the means of orientation. That is to say, Japanese people get to determine what kendo is. And, since Japanese judges are better suited to judge the criterion of zanshin, this also means that Japanese competitors will continue to dominate in kendo competitions. Kendo's attitude about preserving the control over the way that the sport and practice develops is, if you'll forgive me for saying it, a double-edged sword. On one hand, this attitude helps to maintain kendo's status as a unique cultural heritage, and protects it from being watered down through the abandonment of self-perfection in pursuit of professional excellence. However, it has also created difficulties in spreading kendo abroad, and even in appealing to younger generations of Japanese athletes. Much of what kendo is trying to prevent, karate has, by and large, already gone through. Karate was incredibly intentional in its international spread, and has been quite well adapted to the modern interpretation of sports, for better or for worse. A lot of the modern kickboxing movement owes a debt to karateka from the 1970s, 
and the K1 promotion specifically was directly descended from Kyokushin Karate. In fact, much of modern MMA was kicked off by Japanese influences, and specifically karate influences, in one way or another. Before the UFC even got off the ground, within kickboxing and Japanese pro wrestling, there were already some moves in the direction of a more full-contact MMA style of fighting. The style of shoot, derived from the term for an unscripted pro wrestling bout, included striking and stand-up as well as ground grappling. Karate organizations such as the Seidokan were also influential in the development of both kickboxing and shoot wrestling, helping to propel these movements into the modern cage. MMA faced much less of a public pushback in Japan in the early days than it did in either the US or the UK. While the UFC is one of the best known and most dominant MMA promotions, if not the most important one, in its early days, there was significant criticism of it as being mindless blood sport. However, in part due to karate's influence, Japanese audiences were much better primed to accept and enjoy these forms of fighting, and the influence of Japanese fighters on the early UFC helped to make it the juggernaut that it is today. But WKF point sparring is nowhere near the same sport as the UFC, and while there are some incredibly famous Japanese MMA fighters, the Japanese definitely do not have control over mixed martial arts. However, the WKF and its competitive landscape is still greatly controlled by Japanese athletes and judges. While they are by no means the only victors, WKF's ranking of kumite athletes shows a distinct trend towards Japanese competitors placing very highly. This is even more noticeable in kata competition, which is judged even more subjectively and with the criterion of kime, a concept that I haven't gone into in this video, but that both the WKF rulebook and John Donahue's article explicitly compare with Zanshin. I couldn't find hard numbers for what proportion of the WKF's judges are Japanese, but I suspect that you would find a similar trend in that number as well. If I weren't just a person on the internet, and if I had the resources to research this in more detail, I'm sure that the results would say a lot about the reasons why WKF competitions are the way they are. Zanshin is a fundamentally subjective quality. That is to say, you can't measure it directly since it exists internally to the individual karateka. This also means that the judgment of Zanshin, and therefore to a certain extent the judgment of Kumite, has to be done by people who are making their own subjective judgments about whether it was present or not. The fact that there's a hugely subjective element to scoring kumite competitions is the reason why we have judges at all, rather than leave that judgment process completely to machines. But this subjectiveness, and the elusiveness of a definitive definition of zanshin, functions like in kendo as a way of keeping control over what karate should be, at least somewhat in the hands of Japanese officials. I'm not saying that we should do away with zanshin entirely, of course, nor do I think that the aspects of defining zanshin that serve to maintain karate as a unique cultural product of Japan are, in and of themselves, bad things. If you've watched a few of my videos, you'll probably know that I have a decent-sized traditionalist streak in how I define my karate, although of course, what traditions specifically I want to follow is a whole other matter. I'm actually planning on making another one of these deep dive videos, one that gets into the definition of what I mean by tradition, and what the point of these traditions even is, but for the time being, the most definitive video on what traditional martial arts even means is the Art of One Dojo video, which should be showing up in a card right about now. But for right now, I want to point out that Zanshin, as a criterion or as a focus in karate, isn't even strictly speaking traditional. I've thought for some time now that WKF Kumite is heavily influenced by Kendo Shiai, to the point where you could say that Kumite is Kendo without Shinai and with slightly fewer protectors. Zanshin being introduced into karate almost certainly comes from the process that karate went through to become more Japanese, such as when they adopted the gi and obi, or when the Okinawan kata were renamed to fit Japanese pronunciations. I don't doubt that the ideas of awareness were present in the minds of karateka prior to this modern sports movement, but the current form of Zanshin, and perhaps even the term itself, would have been almost completely unknown to karateka of old. Of course, just because some old Okinawan master didn't use a theory doesn't mean that it's useless, or that we shouldn't practice it. Around the time that I started writing this script, the McGregor vs. Poirier fight happened, and I watched it a little bit after the fact, since I don't have $70 to spend on a broken pay-per-view, nor do I have the confidence to attempt to seek out an <clears throat> unofficial stream. We all know how that turned out, of course. Poirier took a few big shots to the chin, unleashed an impressive barrage of lower leg kicks, and ultimately blitzed McGregor into the ground. Looking over that last exchange, though, what I at least saw was Poirier keeping his focus, keeping his hands ready, and gracefully avoiding McGregor's one real attempt at a counterpunch, staying aware right until the moment that the ref stepped between them. And if that ain't Zanshin, 
but I'm not sure that the term has any meaning whatsoever. Alright, so with all of that wrapped up, I think that we've got a pretty good picture of what Zanshin is, where it comes from, and why it plays such a vital role in WKF Kumite, as well as in the practice of a lot of karateka around the world. For a lot of karateka, ritual is very important to their practice. We wear Japanese clothes, use Japanese terms, and often design and decorate our dojos to evoke aesthetics of Japanese architecture and art. However, this trend isn't universal, and many people or dojos find it wholly unnecessary. While I've been on lockdown, I personally have exclusively trained in basketball shorts and a tank top, except for during the few Zoom classes that I've attended, and getting rid of those rituals, as well as the rituals of bowing and meditating as part of practice, honestly hasn't taken anything away from my practice, although I will note that I do occasionally meditate outside of that, usually either early in the morning or right before I'm about to go to bed. I would also be remiss if I didn't mention here that Zanshin's role in maintaining the means of orientation over how karate is practiced places that control in the hands not of the Okinawans, to whom that cultural heritage belongs, but the broader group of Japanese people. Okinawa is currently part of Japan, and it would be inaccurate to say that no Okinawan is positioned as an expert in determining the correct direction that karate should develop in, but a very large amount of modern karate is tied to a national identity of Japanese-ness, in which, until very recently, Okinawans could seldom, if ever, truly participate. Especially those of us who practice karate in the West should keep that in mind, and maybe try to take less of an Orientalist view of what karate should be and what it can be. But when it comes to defining Zanshin for y'all, all that I can really say is, I'm a foreign practitioner and it is by nature difficult for me to grasp what it really means. Thank you all immensely for watching this video. I sure hope it gave you a lot to think about because it took me a while to research, write, and edit. If you enjoyed it, I won't know unless you tell me, so click the I enjoyed the video button, or if you prefer, leave me a comment saying I enjoyed the video. Either one. Or both. I will be making some more videos like this, as well as some shorter ones too, so if you want to see those, subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications if you'd like to. Until next time, I've been the Goju Ryu Philosopher, and it is your mind which will provide you with strength, Grasshopper.